right, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to your daily morning questions. Uh, today, we're gonna go through neurology. Uh, it's one of those um, larger organ system topics. And I think, let's see, is this Stavros coming on here? Um, it's one of the larger organ system topics, similar to cardiology. So, you know, if, if you're coming into this with a good background knowledge, it may just take you uh, a day just to zip through the material and um, really review it. But I think for a lot of people, because of the breadth of, of the system and just how much information it is with the pathways, um, the neuroanatomy alone, you know, it can take a couple of days or even a few days for some people to kind of get through all the material to, to really understand it and to really anchor the material um, to the point where you're able to answer questions um, comfortably. Um, so I wouldn't be discouraged if it takes you longer than you think to get through all this material, because it, it really is quite a bit. Um, and, you know, so um, we have some of the more high yield topics within neurology. Um, one of them being knowing the difference between the findings and anatomy of the upper motor neuron lesions and the lower motor neuron lesions. So we'll go through that a little bit today. Um, obviously knowing the major pathways from where they start in the brain and how they go down to the spinal spinal cord. Uh, those are obviously very high yield. Um, knowing some of the common findings on MRI and, and CT scan are obviously going to be high yield as well, just to be able to orient yourself with the anatomy there. Um, whether you're looking at a coronal cut, a sagittal cut, um, you're going to have to know kind of some of the different angles that they can shoot the brain and, and knowing where relevant structures are in relation to those. Um, and obviously, you're going to have to know some of the high yield uh, pharmacology in, in neurology. So, you know, you guys already probably know, but, you know, epilepsy drugs, those are pretty high yield. Knowing which channels they work on. Is it GABA? Is it sodium channel? Um, uh, Parkinson's medications, uh, medications for headaches, those are all high yield. So that's kind of uh, what we're up against today, but I'm confident that we can get through it quickly and efficiently. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that this will be, will be helpful for you guys just to go through some of these questions as a team and, um, we shall get started. Our first question here. Oh boy. First question is the brachial plexus. Okay. That was not my intention to start you guys off today. First thing in the morning with the brachial plexus question, but this will be a good review. Anybody interested in hopping on? All right, Kristen. Okay, so we have um, which of the following libeled structures of the brachial plexus is most likely to be injured? A 24 year old man is brought to the emergency room after he was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He complains of pain in his right shoulder. Physical examination shows bruising and tenderness palpation just below the right coracoid process. He's unable to flex the right elbow or supinate the right forearm against resistance. Um, there's a decreased sensation to light touch over the anterior lateral forearm. I don't like the brachial plexus, but. I don't either, man. It's, there's a lot going on here, but yeah, yeah so we can get through this. I know it's not C because I'm pretty sure that's a long thoracic. Correct. Good. Um, Oops. the anterior lateral forearm makes me kind of think it's a muscular cutaneous nerve. Okay. Um, which would be G I okay. think flex the right elbow or supinate the right forearm. Yeah, I guess I'll go with G. G you think? Okay. Well, actually maybe it's a, supinate the right forearm maybe it's an herb palsy which would be a flex the right elbow are there any other signs of herb palsy that are maybe not included in this vignette um, oh yeah they don't have abduction correct so okay i'll stick with g then perfect okay let's see anybody else anybody else okay so just quick look at the key info here, right? So it's just below the right coracoid process. He cannot flex the right elbow, right? So which, which which muscle are we talking about here if you can't flex the elbow or supinate? 
Is there a specific muscle that comes to mind? Um, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so so, uh, sorry, go for it. Well, if you can't flat, maybe the biceps or triceps of triceps. I don't yeah, know. So I, I usually think of the biceps brachii and um, the biceps brachii is innervated by the musculocutaneous. And the way that I think of it is that, you know, guys in the gym who, you know, like to flex in front of the mirrors. We all know these, we all know this phenotype. Um, so they like to flex their muscles, musculocutaneous. I think of the biceps brachii. Okay. Yep. So let's take a look here. Fantastic. Okay. Good job. And we can just bring this up really quick. All right. And you can see how the musculocutaneous nerve does sensory for the anterior lateral forearm. Fantastic. Okay. Any questions on this one? I don't think so, unless anyone else does. All right. Speak now. Fair hold your peace. Oh, I don't like questions like this either. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a CT scan of the brain shows an acute infarction in the distribution of the left posterior cerebral artery. Further evaluation of this patient is most likely to show which of the following findings. So he's a 78-year-old right-handed man with hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He's brought to the emergency department for sudden onset of nausea and vertigo one hour ago. His physical examination shows five out of five strength in all extremities. Sensation to light touch and pinprick sensation is decreased in the right arm and leg. And then there's an acute infarction distribution of the left posterior cerebral artery. Um, okay. Well, I think the left posterior cerebral artery would be on the right side. So I'd probably get rid of the A and C. Okay. Good. Um, other than that, I don't left posterior cerebral artery. I don't know. Okay, yeah, so so basically, you know, they're, they're, they're telling you what the diagnosis is. It's a left PCA occlusion, um, yeah. which like you said, and I think you alluded to, that's going to affect the, uh, the left side of the occipital lobe typically. So maybe B? Okay. Right, because most strokes are going to have contralateral effects. Yeah. For the most part, not every time, but for the most part. So let's take a look at the key info here. I think it causes contralateral, um, I don't know how to say what, homo, I don't know how to say the word, but um, hemianopsia. Exactly. Yeah. And what is, what is this like with respect to the visual fields? Like what would that, what's knocked out? Um, what do you mean what's knocked out? Yeah, so if you have right-sided homonymous hemianopia, which visual fields are affected in the patient? Um, I don't know. I need to go through the eye stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those tough ones where you know you got to just kind of know the, the the different pathways and how it's going to affect the eyeball. But it's basically it's the right it's the right visual field in in both eyes. And then similarly for number E, the right-sided superior quadrantopia, that's going to be the right upper quadrant in both eye fields. So let's take a look at the attending tip. Okay, we already said this, PCA supplies the occipital lobe. All right. So did you say B or E or? I said B, yeah. You said B, okay. You'd be absolutely correct. Good job. And it looks like Nicole, uh, Mariam, and Benita, Priya. Okay, looks like everybody was on board with this one. Isn't D also supplied by the posterior cerebral artery? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. People in the chat are saying that. But I think... Let's take a look. Right, because I, I believe prosopagnosia is going to be on the non-dominant side. So it'll be on this patient's right side. Sorry, on his left side. So that is a possibility. Let me see. Okay, it's commonly seen with the right. Right PCA, yeah. okay. okay. Whereas this patient had a left. Okay. okay. Perfect. So this is something that you kind of have to commit to memory, right? Yeah. So this is what we're dealing with with our patient, right? Right-sided, right-sided homonymous hemianopia. Perfect. All right. 
Any other questions on this one? No, I think I just need to actually sit down and review it all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the visual fields one can be tricky. But yeah, if you just go through it, do a couple of questions and draw it out yourself, I feel like that's probably the most effective way to kind of tackle it. Yeah. And if anybody else has any other Jedi mind tricks of how to remember the optic tracks, please let us know. Okay, so we have an MRI of the brain is shown, supplementation of which the following is most likely to prevent this patient's current condition. 59-year-old man with alcohol use is brought to the emergency department with a friend because progressively worsening forgetfulness and frequent falls. He appears disheveled. On mental examination, he's confused and oriented only to person. The neurologic examination shows a horizontal nystagmus on lateral gaze. He walks with a wide base, small steps, and his gait's unsteady. Um, well, I don't know if alcohol use causes a B1 deficiency, which is like Wernicke's, but he doesn't have any signs of the Korsakoff, but he could just have the, so it could be vitamin B1. I don't think it's vitamin B12 because it doesn't talk about anything like anemia or anything. Yeah. Um, B3 is a neosin deficiency. So you get like your pelagria and then the three Ds. So I don't think it's that. Mm -hmm. So I get rid of B12, B3, B9 is folate. And I don't think it's that. B6, I actually don't really know what it is, but I think it's B1 because alcohol can cause it B1 deficiency. Okay, perfect. Let me bring up this. MRI here. Oh, yeah, I guess I didn't even really look at that. And anything stand up to you here? Hmm. No. Yeah. So this one, this one was was pretty tough for me too. Um, I mean, overall, it looks symmetrical. I would say um, we don't have any mass effect. There's no bleeds. So I'm not sure if we would expect to bleed in this patient. However, you know, with with Wernicke's encephalopathy, if this is it, you'd expect lesions in, in specific parts of the brain. And the mammillary bodies. Exactly, yeah, the mammillary bodies, which if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, kind of centrally located right around here. So perhaps this kind of hyperattenuation here is, is telling us something, but we'll have to see when we put the answer in. All right, perfect. So we went through this kind of one by one, uh, B12, unlikely, no, no, no megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. Um, and again, B12 probably wouldn't cause confusion, although it can cause ataxia, right? Because you can have paresthesias, which will make it difficult yeah. for patients to walk. But yeah, I agree. With I just you. like specifically because they said alcohol, and that's what I'm leaning towards B1 versus B12. And there's more symptoms of B12 they haven't mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Let's take a look at the key info here. All right. Alcohol use disorder, wide base gait, small steps, nystagmus. Right. And if, if this is, if this is Wernicke's, um, you know, is there like a triad that you think of or, or certain, um, like a triad of symptoms that you would expect in patients with this? Um, I, when you said triad, I just thought of whack, whack, what wacky wobbly, but that's the, um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So I don't yes. know. Yeah. Wernicke's. Yeah. So Wernicke's, I mean, and, and, you can kind of just go through this vignette and kind of, you know, glean some of the info. So with Wernicke's, you think ataxia, which this patient has. Yeah. And then like confusion. Confusion. Exactly. That's another one. And then ophthalmoplegia, which is like weakness or paralysis of, of some of the eye muscles and you know, horizontal nystagmus is pretty classic for, for Wernicke's. All right. Perfect. Fantastic. All right. So it's the B1 deficiency, which leads to neuronal injury. Um, especially, you know, if, if, uh, if, uh, an alcoholic patient comes into the ED and you give them glucose prior to giving them thymine, um, that glucose infusion will deplete your ATP, uh, in your body, which will, you know, first affect, um, basically tissues that are highly, highly metabolically active like the brain. So that's why you can, you know, precipitate confusion, ophthalmoplegia and things like that in these patients. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at B12. It was the second most common answer. Right. So alcoholics can also have vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, and like you said, it would present with megaloblastic anemia, uh, combined generation of the spinal cord, right? So we're thinking of the, of the lateral cortical spinal tracts as well as the posterior columns. Right. Um, but it would not explain all of this patient symptoms. Like the eyes and the confusion. Precisely. Yes. Okay. 
All right. Moving on, number four. So um, examination shows no abnormalities, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis. We have a seven-year-old boy. He's brought to the physician for recurrent three to four minute episodes of facial grimacing and staring over the past month. He's non-responsive during these episodes and does not remember them afterwards. He recalls a muddy taste in his mouth before the onset of symptoms. One week ago, his brother witnessed an episode where he woke up, stared, and made hand gestures. After the incident, he felt lethargic and confused. Examination shows no abnormalities, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis. Um, okay. I... Yeah, not, I would knock out narcolepsy and I would knock out a myoclonic seizure because that's more muscle movement involvement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would knock out the generalized tonic clonic seizures and the breath holding spell. And I think the complex partial seizure, even though he did have a little bit of hand gestures, but it seems to be more like staring blankly. Mm -hmm. Um. So maybe a simple partial seizure, because I feel like absence, you wouldn't have the hand gestures. I agree. Yeah, I don't think with absence, you would have you know much movement at all. So you're yeah, maybe a here. simple partial seizure. Okay. But. Okay, so it looks like, looks like Priya is asking, what is a tonic seizure? So a tonic seizure, um, you want to think of when a pres when a patient is presenting with what seems like is is syncope or passing out, right? So a tonic seizure, um, basically their They're entire like body just goes right? limp. What's that? I thought you got like stiffening and atonic seizures. I believe it's they they just kind of go limp. You okay, may be so right. Then tonics, then tonics, the stiffening one. Yeah, yeah. So tonia okay. would be stiffening, and then clonus would be movement. So atonia would be the opposite, um, right? I believe would mean limp. Okay. Um, and atonic seizures does overlap somewhat with narcolepsy because people who have narcolepsy can also pass out all of a sudden, you know, if they have intense emotions or are laughing a lot, they can also drop like that. So that would also be a differential diagnosis for patients who's coming in with syncope. Oh, actually it could be absence too, because absence, you get the, um, I think confusion afterwards. Okay. Right. With absence. I don't believe you have confusion afterwards. They just have, you know, like a five to 10, 10 second kind of pause staring into the, staring into the sunset. And then they, they keep okay. going. So. All right. So I guess I'll just stick with simple partial, but I don't know. Okay. Let's take a look. Okay. So simple partials, they can't present with an aura, which this patient had with his muddy taste, abnormal motor movements, but he has impaired awareness. So maybe the episodes. complex partial seizure. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that, and that's, and that's sort of the key distinction here, right? So when you have partial example? seizures, that's just going to affect one area of the brain. Okay. As opposed to generalized seizure, which can, which is going to have kind of more diffuse symptoms. But when you're thinking of partial seizures, a simple one would have basically no, no change in awareness. Whereas a complex one, you would have, you know, not necessarily loss of consciousness, but um, you know, this patient was non-responsive and, didn't remember his episode afterwards. So my money would be on a complex partial. Okay. Perfect. Right. And so complex partial seizures, you can also see automatisms like, like lip smacking, like we saw in this patient, as well as hand gestures where you're kind of not writhing, but almost just like fidgeting a little bit with your hands, Yeah. Uh, which this patient had. So um, yeah, it's pretty classic for complex partial. Let's see, Stavros is saying, so absent seizures uh, involve brief, sudden lapses of consciousness. They're more common in children than adults. Perfect. And then Benita is saying muddy taste is an aura. Correct. And that can be with grand mal also, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so, so people with seizures can have auras. Um, they can be gustatory, like, like this patient where you have kind of a weird taste. Some people have visual auras where they see like, bright lights flashing. Um, some people will have like a sensation like a deja vu. So auras can really span kind of the gamut of, of what our senses can, can perceive. Um, smell too, that's correct, yeah. Um, 
I mean, I, I think that's one of the reasons why neurology is so interesting. There's such a wide, there's such a wide breadth of what can happen to, to someone's brain, you know, certainly in the setting of a seizure. So at least, at least I find it interesting. Um, so anybody else have any other questions on this one? Let's take a look at absence actually here. All right, so periods of brief unresponsiveness, interrupted motor or activity, anterior grade amnesia while tone and staring are maintained. Okay, All right, and absence are usually less than 20 seconds, not accompanied by any prodromal symptoms like the or like that this, that this patient had or post ictal, -ictal lethargy like this patient had as well. Okay, shall we move on? Mm -hmm. Okay, so based on the symptoms, which are the following labeled areas in the schematic overview of a normal brain is likely affected. A 55-year-old man is brought to the emergency department because of a sudden onset of difficulty speaking for one hour. He has hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes. His current medications include atorvastatin, lisinopril, and metformin. He's seven foot tall. On examination, the patient speaks slowly in simple sentences that consist of only one word. He seems to have difficulties understanding grammatically complex sentences and appears to be frustrated at the inability to speak fluently. He's able to follow commands. And when another individual tries to enter the room, the physician asks the patient to hold the door and he does so immediately. Based on symptoms, what is the following labeled? Well, I'm pretty sure that this is um, Broca's because he has the frustration, whereas in one case he wouldn't. So I think it's D, which is like the superior part of the frontal lobe. Okay, perfect. Right, so if we take a look at all the different parts of the brain here, frontal lobe here, obviously, temporal, parietal, occipital. Here's the cerebellum here and the cord coming down. And then I think F would have been the Wernicke's area. Exactly, yeah. So F, F would be Wernicke's. Uh, D, like you said, would be Broca's. Um, what would A be here? Uh, the primary motor cortex. Or no, the B is the primary motor cortex, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so B would be, would be primary motor cortex and then right behind it would be the, the, it's the primary, uh, so primary somatosensory cortex. Yeah. And so A would be the pre-motor cortex. Right. And that's for like planning movements. Exactly. Yes. So you can imagine if you have a hard time planning movements, that includes, you know, coordination of your mouth as you're trying to speak. So, so people with, with, with planning uh, issues will have kind of distorted speech and halting speech where they just kind of stop being able to talk. Okay. Okay. And then G would be visual would be uh, would be the um that's the occipital lobe, namely the visual cortex. Yeah. And then how about E down here? Uh, I think that's the auditory. Perfect. All right. Do you know your neuroanatomy? Well yesterday I started really focusing on the brain like that specific picture. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Perfect. And that and that's going to be a high yield thing to know. Right, just knowing the basic areas of the brain, Broca's, Wernicke's, auditory. Okay. So we're thinking D here. Okay. Yeah. And then how would you describe this patient's symptoms? Right, because he 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 definitely has aphasia. Is there a, a certain type of aphasia that you think he has? Um. I maybe well, there's global aphasia, and then where are the other one? I don't know. Expressive aphasia was the other one that I'm thinking of. I don't think it's global. So maybe expressive. Okay. Let's see what this answer is. Okay, we went through this already. Attending tip. Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. Interesting. Uh, is that a Harry Potter character? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Right, so Broca's area is is going to be synonymous with kind of a broken mouth or a broken boca, as it as it as it as, it, as the word goes in um, in Spanish. Right, so he has non-fluent telegraphic speech, where he has constant repetition of one word, but he is able to follow commands and he expresses frustration, like you said, which is pretty typical in a patient with with Broca's area uh, involvement. Mm -hmm. And like you said, if if this was affecting the 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 uh, Wernicke's area. He'd be able to talk. It would be grammatically correct, but it it would basically be nonsensical, right? So if a person asked, uh, you know, how is your day? If this if this was a Wernicke's lesion, they would say, oh, down by the river, and the people were talking, and and in the water we went. They would say something kind of like that. Yeah, like it would make no sense. 
Yes. Yeah. And there's actually a really fascinating YouTube video on it. It's like a quick two minute clip if for those who are interested. Okay. And it looks like the next best answer was E. And like you said, that was the primary auditory cortex, right? Which kind of sits at the top of the, of that temporal lobe. Right. So obviously if you have an issue with the primary auditory context, you can have difficulty with sound localization. If it's bilateral, you can be, be become fully deaf and basically have cortical uh, deafness. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> so physical examination of the patient is most likely to show which of the following findings. We have a 25 year old man. He's brought to the emergency department 30 minutes after he was involved in a motorcycle collision. He was not wearing a helmet and he's got left periorbital ecchymosis. CT scan of the head shows a fracture of the greater wing of the left sphenoid bone with compression of the left superior orbital fissure. Mm. Okay. Periorbital. Okay, so I don't think it's A or B because I think it has to do with the eyes. Right, and so A would be which which nerve? Um, the olfactory. Exactly, cranial nerve one. And the numbness to the left cheek, which? That could be like facial, seven. Facial would be more motor. Okay, the. Um, to the face would be. Like the maxillary nerve or? Precisely, yeah, V2. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, okay, I don't think it's. D. Okay. Why don't you think it's D? I don't know. I just don't. Okay. Which which, which cranial nerve? Um, Is that a G? Exactly. A cranial nerve six. That so that helps with the lateral gaze with the lateral rectus. There you go. Uh, LR six SO four would be the mnemonic. I and feel like it, I sorry, don't know the, the rest of them say left eye, so I don't. I could be any of them. It's either constricted left pupil, an absent corneal reflex, or complete loss of vision. I don't think it would be complete loss of vision. Right, that that would basically be transection of of the optic nerve between the yeah. eyeball and the optic chiasm. So I don't think it would be that. Um, and and then with C, so you have you have you have fixed meiosis. So you have a pinpoint pupil on the left, inability to dilate. So what what sort of lesion or what's what what nerve do you think might be involved there? Uh, cranial nerve three. Okay. When I was reading C, I was thinking maybe Horner syndrome. Yeah. That's that's something that I was also maybe considering. So what's that cranial nerve seven? Is Horner seven? Oh, Horner's would be a, uh, it, it would be an it issue be with, like some, a with a sympathetic right. chain. So yeah, maybe E then. Okay. Right. So, the, so the corneal reflex, right. So, so um, if you, if someone is touching your eyeball, it's going to be, um, it's going to be V1 or your ophthalmic nerve. The, the, you'll have the first branch of the trigeminal nerve that feels that. That's the afferent limb. And then the efferent limb would be cranial nerve seven to basically cause your eyes to shut. Well, for C for Horner syndrome, I know you can get it from like the Pancos tumor, but I don't like, I know that there's more reasons you can also get it. Like, I don't know if it was be, would be like hemorrhaging from like the periorbital, like ecchymosis of bruising. Right. Um, but I don't know the other causes of it. I just think of Pancos. Right. Pancos would be uh would be a tumor in the lung at the at the yeah. very top at the apex, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that can definitely cause Horner syndrome. So let's take a look here. He doesn't have any of the other signs of it though. Right. Meiosis, anhydrosis, things like that. Yeah. Right. So it's basically pointing us towards the left superior orbital fissure. So it kind of comes down to knowing kind of your anatomy and which nerves come through here. The way that I like to remember it, it's orbital. So you think of your eye nerves, right? So cranial nerve three, uh, four, six, and V1, right? So three is the ocular motor, four is the trochlear, six is the abducens. So here's the attending tip, right? So three, four, V1, and abducens. 
Okay. Well, I thought C- the cranial nerve three could cause C as well. I don't know. I guess because I'm so stuck, I'll go with the lowest one, which is the rule. So I'll go with E. E, okay. Right. Sometimes you just got to go with your gut and your gut would be correct in this instance. Right. Perfect. So the corneal reflex requires V1, right, which is the afferent limb, which passes through the superior orbital fissure. It'd be likely disrupted in this patient with a compressive fracture. Perfect. Perfect. And without, without the afferent, there's no motor response from the seventh cranial nerve. Yeah. Let's take a look at C here. All right, so fixed constricted pupil would not be expected. Fractures impinging the superior orbital fissure can lead to fixed dilated okay. because of damage to the parasympathetic nerves and cranial nerve three. Okay. So meiosis, you think of Horner syndrome and lateral pontine strokes. Okay. That that's that 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 that's a good that's a useful distinction. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Good. Move on. So, um, which of the following is most appropriate pharmacotherapy for the patient? Sixty-two-year-old man comes to the physician because of tremors in both hands for the past few months. He has had difficulty buttoning his shirt, holding a cup of water without spilling a content. And a couple of weeks ago, he's noticed that his symptoms improved after drinking a glass of whiskey. Medical history is remarkable for bronchial asthma. His maternal uncle began to develop similar symptoms around the same age. His medication are daily, are all beautiful, are buteral and fluconazone. And then examination shows a low amplitude tremor bilaterally when the arms are outstretched and it worsens during the finger to nose test. Which of the following is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy for this patient? Um, can't propranolol help with the resting tremors? I don't think it's valproic acid, so I get rid of that. I don't think it's um, A, alprazolam, so I get rid of that. I don't think it's C. Yeah, I'd probably just stick with D, propranolol. Okay. But people are saying C. I don't actually know what, that's the only drug here. I don't know what it is. Right. Yeah, and and, and so when, when you have someone presenting with, with a tremor, there's a bunch of things that can cause it, but... Uh, it's important to delineate, you know, is this a resting tremor or an intention tremor? In other words, does the, does the tremor get worse um, with movement, with purposeful with movement? And like it says here. Yeah, exactly. So I think, I think this patient has more of an intention tremor that gets worse when you're, when you go to reach a cup, like, so if I'm going like here, you're kind of going like this. And so um, that's kind of one, one useful, one, one useful thing to remember. Um, so this would point more towards an essential tremor, like Kanayo is saying, perfect. And then a resting tremor, what would, that, what would that make you think of? Like Parkinson's? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, I get rid of B, but I just have between C and D. Okay. I think that they can both treat it. I don't know if there's like one that treats it better, but I'd probably just stick with D because that was my gut. Okay. But. Are there any any patients that you might want to be cautious in in um, in, uh, in giving them a... Uh, uh, a beta blocker? Yeah. Especially people, non-selective one. Well, it can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Good. Does it say anything about him having? No, it doesn't really talk about him having like diabetes or anything. Correct. So, so, so panel is contracted in asthma patients. What right. Yeah. And you can imagine if you're, if you're blocking your beta twos, that's going to be harder for, you know, al, 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 albuterol to work. And so you basically have um, kind of worsening bronchial constriction. So that's one possibility. Right. And okay, so, so in a patient like this who has asthma, you might want to be a little bit cautious there. So then maybe C. Okay. Which so we have the key info. So his tremor is bilateral. It gets better when he drinks whiskey. He's got asthma, low, low amplitude tremor bilateral that gets worse with, with intentional movements. Intending tip here, right? So essential tremor, like exactly like Kanaya was saying. So let's take a look at primidone here. Okay, awesome. Had the patient not had asthma, would either of them been fine? Yes, although I don't think they would have put both of those answers since they're both since okay. they're both first line. Okay, sounds good. They're likely to put one or the other. But right, so primidone, not super common. I hadn't really heard of it until recently. 
Um, it's actually a prodrug of, of uh, phenobarbital, right? So that's a barbiturate, which are not mm-hmm. used as often these days. However, primidone is, is effective with, with those with, uh, with, with a central tremor. And interestingly, so um, people with a central tremor um, sometimes enjoy drinking al- alcohol. So they'll have it maybe a little more frequently than you would expect because it helps their tremor. Um, and those with tremor can really, um, it can affect their entire lives just because you can just think of how much we use our hands for every little thing, typing, writing, um, texting on our phone. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, this is a disease that, that can really affect people's lives. Um, but you're, you're spot on. So it's either going to be propranolol or primidone as kind of the first line medications. Okay. All right. Any other questions here? I don't have any. Okay. Okay, so we have an eight-year-old boy who undergoes resection of a primary brain tumor. Microscopic examination of the resected specimen shows calcifications in cystic areas filled with cholesterol cyst crystals. This tumor was likely located in which of the following labeled areas. I'm pretty sure that kids' tumors are on the bottom side of the brain. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, often childhood, childhood brain cancer is going to be um, infratentorial or typically involving like the cerebellum down here. Yeah. So I get rid of um, the top two there, A and B. Okay. Just by probability. Okay. And then the crystal or the cholesterol crystals makes you think of the craniopharyngioma. Okay. Um, where, where would that be located? I'm pitty sure this one's close to like the pituitary gland, but I don't actually know where the pituitary gland is on this picture. Okay. So um okay, I don't so know. that's like the diagnosis I'm sticking with. I just can't label it on that picture. Okay. Right, so A and B are going to be obviously above the tentorium. Uh, C, what do you think C is pointing to? I don't know, but. Okay. Yeah, I don't know this picture. I think maybe it could be D. Right, so D is pointing to the pineal gland here. So that's a possibility. Yeah, I don't think it would be E because it's more like located in the cerebellum there. Right, and so you think of cerebellum, you think of things like... um, uh, you can have medulloblastomas, which are which are pretty common. Um, I believe also low grade pilocytic astrocytomas can be located in the in the cerebellum as well. Right. F here looks like it's also in the cerebellum, but it looks like it could also be compressing the the uh, cerebral aqueduct as it's flowing into the fourth ventricle here. Right. And then G looks like it could be in the fourth ventricle. So, which could also be like the medulloblastoma or the ependymoma. Ependymoma. Um, we will have to see. Um, well, I think this is the craniopharyngioma, so I think D. Okay. Let's take a look at the key info here. So, eight-year-old boy, primary brain tumor, calcification in cystic areas with cholesterol crystals. Look at the attending tip. Exactly. So you're. You're on the right track for sure. And so we're thinking D? Yeah, kind of C or D, but I'd stick with D because. Okay. Let's take a look. Okay. So this would involve the pineal gland. And so um, uh, pinealomas, they're expected to arise uh, obviously from the pineal gland, most common of which is a germinoma, which would show uh, undifferentiated germ cells. Um, however, the calcifications would not be expected. Okay. And so I don't you know, know, maybe that little one that hangs down there, see? Okay, a little one hanging out. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look here. Perfect. Okay. So, you, so um, that was good. You were able to narrow it down to two. Um, and in this case, it's just a matter of knowing where, where the pituitary glands yeah, where sits, it is. Right. And it's going to be kind of this little, this little bulb here, this little or- Christmas ornament that's hanging down here right? And the cella, which is going to be pretty close to your optic chiasm, right? So that's why we see with, with, with like pituitary adenomas or even current, uh, or even craniopharyngiomas, 
um, that can cause compression on the optic chiasm, which would cause that bitemporal hemianopsia that you see in those patients. Yeah. Perfect. Right, so craniofringiomas, although they're pretty benign, they 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 tend to recur, and so it's um it's it's a really tough go for a lot of those patients. So we had some frequent flyers when I was when I was in pediatrics, and you know these patients would would sometimes be pan hypo pan hypo pit, right? So they would have to get DDAVP to to help with their with their salt. Um, they'd also be on thyroid replacement and kind of all the different hormones. Um, hormones that are, that are basically released by the pituitary gland can be affected by craniopharyngiomas. Yeah. All right. And Benita says, isn't craniopharyngioma super tentorial? It is. Yes. Yeah. It is super tentorial. And although, although kids are most likely to have infratentorial um, uh, brain tumors, um, it's possible they can also have supra. Okay. Okay. Good. Moving on. So the patient's mass is most likely derived from much of the following cells. A previously healthy 50 year old woman is brought to the emergency department 30 minutes after she was observed having a seizure on arrival. She's conscious and reports she feels drowsy An MRI of the brain shows a four centimeter round, sharply demarcated mass. She undergoes a resection of the mass. And then a photograph of the section of the resected specimen is shown. What did they come from? Um, yeah, can we open the picture? Yes. Yeah, I don't know why I thought this was going to help. I suck at looking at these pictures. Yeah, so this, uh, I agree, histology is, is is pretty tough. But, you know, in I think in this case, you know, this is like a pretty unique finding that, you know, I think if you look at it a couple of times, you'll, it'll stick in your memory. Okay. And um, it has to do with, 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 with uh, dystrophic calcification. Um, I don't know if that brings anything to mind. You can uh, see this in, in papillary carcinoma of the thyroid as well. Like somoma bodies? Exactly. Yes. Somoma bodies. Right. So it's sort of these, these little concentric circles here, which are the result of dystrophic calcification in, uh, in tissues that you would not expect to have calcium. Right. Is it, what is the disease with the onion skin or like, cause I thought like the onion skinning thing here, but. Mm. Like the, the circles, but so some of my bodies. Yes. Yeah. When, uh, if you say onion skinning, I would think of like arteriosclerosis, maybe affecting the kidneys. Yeah. Um, although there, there may be other entities that I'm missing there, but that's kind of what I think of when you say onion skinning. All right. Well, some of my bodies are in like the, what is the thing? The brain or neuro and the brain would be, I guess, um, meningioma. Okay. That's what they're getting at there, which would be um, I think E. Okay. Why do you say E as opposed to 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 the other ones? Because I'm pretty sure the men meningioma is arachnoid cells. Um, I don't think it's Schwann or oligodendrocyte, so I get rid of those two. I don't think it's blood vessels. Okay. Or neurons. And then astrocytes is like the GFAP positive glioblastoma. And then the only, yeah, I would say um, E. Okay. Let's take a look. Key info, round, sharply demarcated, seizure, tinning tip. Perfect. Spot on. Okay. Meningioma. Survey says, all right, we got a winner. Right. So, and so this one, you know, we're thinking of a meningioma. And so once you have that diagnosis, you can just think of the layers of the meningi of the dura, you have the arachnoid and then the PM otter. And so that's kind of how I made that connection between arachnoid cells and uh, meningioma. Okay. So perfect. That's helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Right. So, the, so these come from the arachnoid cells of the arachnoid villi, typically benign and, um, will manifest as slow growing, sharply demarcated uh, mass that is uh, composed of spindle shaped cells in a world pattern, right? So if we click on here, right? So you can kind of see the world pattern here as well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's take a look at oligodendrocytes here, right? So oligodendrocytes, you typically have a fried egg appearance like you see in a seminoma as well. Right. Um, 
where you kind of have, um, you know, a large round nucleus surrounded kind of by, by, by a clear cytoplasm, right? So you have the egg yolk here and the egg white kind of around it. Okay. Perfect. Anything else with this? I'm trying to think. What well, one's blood vessels? Is that a tumor? I can't think of which one it would be. Yeah, blood vessel. I mean, I think there's a lot of cancers that arise from blood vessel, but. But I mean, like in the brain, like neuro specifically. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not really sure what they're trying to get out here. So let's see. Okay, so hemangioblastomas. And that would usually be a, be infratentorial. Okay. Right? Closely arranged thin walled capillaries with minimal intervening parenchyma. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Cerebellar hemangioblastoma. Right. That's not something that I think you'll see all that often on the on the exam. However, hemangioblastomas, I think, are probably associated with maybe one of the neurocutaneous disorders, if I'm not mistaken. Someone can maybe look that up. Or is it VHL? Benita is saying per perhaps VHL. Okay. Von Hippel Lindau. Okay, so, so von Hippel Lindau, you have the bilateral renal carcin renal cell carcinoma, and then perhaps mangioblastomas as well. Okay. Very good. Moving on. Um, Twenty-year-old man comes to the physician because of worsening gait and sittiness, bilateral hearing loss for one month. He has intermittent tingling sensations on both cheeks over this time period. He has no history of serious medical illness and takes no medications. Autometry shows bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Genetic evaluation shows a mutation of tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 22 that encodes Merlin. Which of the following is the condition? Um, yeah, I think, well, it's, is it a schwannoma? That's what I think about when I hear like nearing hearing loss. Okay, schwannoma, that could be like an acoustic neuroma, which which could perhaps explain some of his symptoms here. All right, I'll try to knock some out. So I don't think it's a renal cell carcinoma. Um, I agree. I don't think it is um, a meningioma. Okay. Astrocytoma. No, I don't think it's an, mm, no, I don't think it's an astrocytoma. If you go back to the last sentence, like what's the, What's the question asking? Right, he's at increased risk. Increased, oh, increased falling. risk for. I don't okay. think it's asking like what is. What is? Yeah. This, okay. Right. And and that, and that sort of requires you to kind of put everything together and say, you know, what what's the diagnosis in this patient who has? And then what he actually has? a bilateral hearing loss? Well, yeah, well, chromosome twenty two is NF two. Okay. Good. So. I think that, yeah, I'd probably put C back there and pick C. Okay. Yeah, I was, I just read that too fast and I just thought, what are we looking at? Yeah. And I, I think the first time I went through this question too, I was like increased risk and I was like, well, gosh, what is this describing? But then you yeah. know, it, it is kind of easy to kind of gloss over that. So, and then optic glioma, A, what would you see that? Like what disease would you see that in? Um, optic gliomas. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it, it'd be more NF1, right? It'd be neurofibromatosis type one with optic glioma. And in those patients, you might also see pheochromocytoma. Yeah, like pheoc and then the cafe au lait spots and stuff. Cafe au lait spots and then, and the neurofibromas or the, it, it's a neurocutaneous skin nodule and it's almost like a very large mole that's kind of flapping in the wind there. So we can take that out. And so you're thinking meningioma? Yeah, I'm thinking meningioma. Okay. There you go. All right, so bilateral schwannomas, which this patient has, which is affecting his hearing. Uh, you can also have multiple cerebral and spinal tumors, as well as meningiomas. And like we just said in the last question, meningiomas can be associated with somoma bodies if you're looking under histology. Right. Right. And so. This is kind of a nice little schematic showing the difference between NF neurofibromatosis type one and neurofibromatosis type two. Right, so in NF one, you can have optic gliomas, which can affect the vision uh, on the respective side, Lish nodules, pheos, um, 
as well as these, these multiple neurofibromas uh, all over the body. I've only seen neurofibromas type one once in my life. We had a patient who presented to the ED uh, with, with profound hypertension um, as, as a result of a pheochromocytoma. And I, I just remember his, his skin lesions being, you know, obviously the most visible aspect of his disease. Um, and if type two, I'm not sure if I've ever seen this in real life, but obviously this is what this patient has in our vignette. And like we said, they can cause meningiomas, uh, spinal tumors, uh, skin nodules called schwannomas, um, and early onset bilateral cataracts, apparently. Okay. Let's see, optic glioma. Oh, and, and, and one thing, uh, when you have to remember the, this chromosome 22, uh, NF2 has a two in it. Um, and if two patients um, can have issues with their hearing, so you have two ears and they can have cataracts in their eyes. So you have two eyes, two ears, two eyes, 22. That's kind of how I remember it. Okay. Yep. And then Merlin, I think of a merman, but I don't think that really, that doesn't really help anything. <laughs> okay. All right. Number 11. Okay. So. There is a non-tender ulcer on the plantar surface of her left foot. The pedal pulses are strong bilaterally and her hemoglobin A1C concentration is 8.6, which of the following processes is most likely involved in the pathogenesis of this patient's current symptoms. You have a 61-year-old woman. She comes to the physician for evaluation of numbness and a burning sensation in her feet for the past five months. She has type 2 diabetes, hypercholesterolemia. Her blood pressure is 119 over 82. Neurologic examination that shows a decreased sensation to pinprick, light touch, and vibration over the soles of her feet. And there's a non-tender ulcer on the plantar surface of her feet. Okay. Um, demyelination of the posterior columns and lateral cortical spinal tracts. Accumulation of lipids in the foam. So I don't think it's A. Why don't you think it's A? Um because I isn't the lateral actually maybe the lateral is vibration and touch the posterior columns. I tried to go through these tracks yesterday, but I just can't seem to get them. Um, yeah, I, I feel like the tracks are maybe one of the harder harder parts of 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 neuro, at least for me, and I think for a lot of a lot of my uh, a lot of my peers too, while we were going through the material. Um, LCST. Um, it, it carries motor tracks, but if, if you have an issue with the LCST, you would expect to have upper motor neuron signs, Okay. You know, which we don't really see in our patient. And so upper motor neuron signs, you think hyperreflexia and, yeah. and, and things like that. So accumulation of lipids and foam cells in the arteries. Yeah. What, what pathophysiological process would, would be described here? Atherosclerosis. Exactly. Yeah. So atherosclerosis and, um, Atherosclerosis obviously can affect the heart and lead to an MI. Uh, it can lead to strokes if you have a bunch of atherosclerosis in your carotids. Um, and it can also cause peripheral vascular disease, which could maybe cause this, this lady's symptoms, but do you, do you feel like it fits perfectly or is there something else that might not? Um, I'll leave it for a sec, but okay. yeah. Um, increased protein deposition in the endoneuro vessel walls. Mm -hmm. I feel like this one also makes sense because it's more like nerves versus arteries. Okay. Dystrophic calcification of the arterial media. I don't think it's that. D. Osmotic damage to the oligodendrocytes. I don't think it's that. E. Elevated hydrostatic pressure in the arterial lumen. It could be that. Um, in the arterial or lumen. I don't know. Yeah, and so when, when, when you basically come down to three answers like these, um, you kind of want to go through each one in your mind and 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 see what, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, right? Well, I feel like C makes sense because like the nerves versus just arteries in A and B and F. So maybe C. Okay. Actually, I don't think it's F. I don't think it's elevated hydrostatic pressure. Okay. 
right? So F is trying to get at maybe a patient who has who has congestive heart failure, where you have elevated volume in your in your bloodstream, and um, that can lead to increased hydrostatic oh. pressure. And uh, to me, that would lead more to like pitting edema as opposed to a to a yeah more edema. That's just, I'm thinking. Yeah, exactly. C, I'm be C. Can you go with C? Okay. There you go. Perfect. Only a third of your of your colleagues got it right. So yeah, this was a tough one. Four hammers. Right. Yeah, so so like nerves over arteries here. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the pathogenesis of uh, of uh, of um, peripheral neuropathy as as can be seen in, in people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. Right. So basically, what happens is you have increased protein deposition. Right, and we know that if you have high high blood glucose that can basically cause glycosylation of all sorts of proteins, either in the plasma or in the tissues. Um, and in fact, one way that you measure, um, you know, uh, how well a patient is controlling their diabetes is you measure glycated hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin right. A1C is- Is it over six hemoglobin. is diabetes or? What's that? Over six is, isn't that specific for it? It would be 6.5%, okay. yeah. Um, but yeah, this one was kind of an interesting one, kind of getting at the, the different pathophysiology, um, uh, that can cause foot ulcers, right? So accumulation of lipids and foam cells and arteries, like you said, would be atherosclerosis. Um, but that would lead more to like peripheral arterial disease, which typically would present with weak pulses. Our patient's pulses were strong and these foot ulcers are typically very painful, right? Versus a diabetic foot ulcer, which, um, you know, typically is not painful, right? Because they've lost sensation in their nerves there. So yeah. good job. Okay. One more, maybe really quick. Sure. So what is the farm? The patient's symptoms improve rapidly after pharmacotherapy is initiated and his weakness completely resolves, which of the following drugs is most likely administered. We have a 78 year old man. He's brought to the emergency department ambulance. Um, by ambulance, 30 minutes after sudden onset of speech difficulties, right-sided leg and arm weakness. Uh, examination shows paralysis and hypoesthesia of the right side, positive Babinski sign on the right side and slurred speech. A CT scan of the head shows a hyperdensity in the left middle cerebral artery and no evidence of intracranial bleeding. The patient's symptoms improve rapidly after the pharmacotherapy is initiated and weakness resolves. Well, I think that rapidly would be all to place. Okay. And you'd be absolutely correct, right? Right. So Altaplace um, can can be used in the setting of you know if, if someone has a has a has a massive pulmonary embolus that can be used to kind of break up the clot. Um, you can use it if you have a large occlusion causing a, a massive stroke, like in this patient. Um, Altaplace must be given within four and a half hours of the onset of stroke symptoms in order to be effective. Right. Um, we also see Altaplace used in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction. So perfect. Good job. Okay. Good job, guys.